We turn now to uh, the critical theorist Jürgen Habermas. And um, Habermas and his um, successors uh, have combined uh, critical theory, Frankfurt School critical theory, um, with, uh, with a, a, a more inclined hermeneutic tradition. Uh, hermeneutics was always an important part of the, the Frankfurt School. Um, we're talking about Theodore, Theodore Adorno, um, uh, Walter Benjamin, uh, Eric Fromm. These were uh, Max Horkheimer. These were all individuals uh, in, at the Frankfurt School in uh, Frankfurt, Germany that uh, combined uh, psychoanalysis and, uh, and Marxist theory. Maybe their m most famous uh, representative uh, was um, Herbert Marcuse, who was a professor in the United States uh, and uh, motivated many of the, the hot academics, in other words, academics that were politically engaged in social revolution. So critical theory has always uh, had a, a radical element to it, a po politically active element. Uh, Habermas is active in uh, a critique of social sciences, and uh, some of his main ideas um, were later uh, advanced with um, by, by successors in his theory, and we're going to look at some of those ideas and how they manifested from um, uh, successors to his thinking. Here's some highlights of Habermas's uh, critical ideas uh, of the social sciences. He says, firstly, that social science, sci scientists, psychologists should challenge the claim that uh, psychology is an objective science. He takes uh, issue with this basic premise that, uh, that, that, um, that the human condition, again, can be studied objectively. Uh, as in an object in natural sciences, and he goes back to this idea of the subject and object relationship and what happens when uh, human ex psychological experiences become the object of research uh, that is investigated by the subjective researcher. He's also interested in studying the relationships between subject and object, the historical relationship. In other words, this is context. Uh, a theme that we see in uh, the Gestalt psychology tradition, the context between the subject and uh, the object. In other words, the researcher and the researched. Uh, he's also um, critical that all phenomena will take the shape of the school of thought which is viewed. Um, so in other words, as we had seen previously with Gadamer, um, the, the research perspective that we take will... Um, necessarily determine what we see. Uh, the lens through which we view something will take the, 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 the object itself will take on the image of that of that filter, of that theoretical filter. Uh, in addition, we see a lot of themes in Habermas that we also see in the, uh, the philosopher of science, Thomas Kuhn. And uh, that is the idea that um, Science is a, a social construct that we come to uh, understand um, a, a consensus in in uh, the scientific community. So the, there there's a consensus that forms along groups of thinkers, and that way of thinking becomes, um, in a sense, hegemonic. It becomes dominant, and um, thinking outside of that paradigm, that way of thinking, uh, becomes. Uh, problematic, which is a limitation to thought. Uh, so um, Habermas points out that consensus might be rational, but it's it's not always convincing. Uh, often there's a consensus uh, of ideas that uh, that leave us unsatisfied, that are that don't quite uh, hit the mark in uh, understanding. And in this tradition, uh, Thomas Teo, another. Um, individual who's thinking along the lines of critical theory and hermeneutics uh, says that the most important thing that um, that can happen in a in, an, in a scientific dis uh, research is the discussion. So the data isn't the most important aspect of research, but the discussion about the data. And um, this is pointed out that um, there's there in psychology, especially there seems to be um, maybe a certain uh, worship around data that doesn't go discussed, that isn't uh, that isn't 
um, vehemently argued and uh, multiple uh, theories put forth. So we have a lot of data, but we don't have a lot of thinking about data. And um, in my experience, the most uh, thoughtful of uh, researchers that I've encountered have have uh, have ex- has have expressed this concern in psychology that we do have a lot of data gathering, but we don't have a lot of thinking about data. One can certainly make an entire career out of thinking about the data that so many others have collected. Um, we we've stressed so often in our graduate programs and also in undergraduate training uh, that uh, data collection is so important. In and we don't have uh, even our research methods courses seem to be focused around collecting data rather than really thinking about data. And now I'm not talking about processing that data uh, in statistical programs. I'm talking about what this actually means and getting into truly thoughtful and theoretical, philosophical, uh, moral understandings of the data. So we're looking here in this argument for something called the hermeneutic surplus of interpretation. That means many different ideas about what data means and discussions, thoughtful intellectual discussions uh, about that data. So the most important part of the study should be the discussion and not the data. And unfortunately, in psychology research, we'll find that the discussion sections of the uh, journal articles are uh, typically very um, uh, slight in comparison to other sections of the, of the journal articles. Now, the opposite of this idea of a hermeneutic surplus would be the idea of a hermeneutic deficit. And this would be, this is the, what the term that is used by critical theorists to, um, critical theorists who, who focus on human, uh, hermeneutic uh, investigations to neglect um, the psychology to critically consider methodological and epistemological problems with the issues. So the, uh, the, the tendency to not question the idea or the ideology of objectivity as it is, presents itself in the social sciences. So in other words, psychologists who um, dismiss out of hand any criticisms of the natural science approach, of the idea and theoretical concepts that we can objectively uh, discuss uh, mental events, etc., the the problems of of the issue of the methodology we use, when this conversation is lacking when when intellectuals or psychologists uh, refuse to have the discussion um, that is referred to as a hermeneutic deficit now closely related to this idea of the hermeneutic deficit is the idea of epistemological violence and this is when um, members of the dominant uh, way of looking at things in other words the dominant paradigm when these individuals um, present data in a way or have conversations about the the nature of psychology, the methodology, the research, the theories um, that are uh, dismissive and uh, even present data in a way that inferiorizes other traditions uh, of schools of thought um, outside of that dominant paradigm. It's referred to as epistemological violence. So um, an example is when interpretation is taken as pure fact rather than a te- contextually situated description, um, th- this is an act of epistemological violence. So it's it's really um, overstating, overestimating, and not taking a critical look at one's own uh, paradigm of thought. So this is uh, tip- typically a, a criticism of a dominant paradigm um, we may see this today in cr- cognitive psychology, in neuroscience approaches, in biological psychology, and certainly historically in the past we saw the, this attitude taken by behaviorists, um, positivist, any type of positivist uh, um, uh, position, theor- theoretical position in the social sciences um, can be said to, uh, and we can find examples of epistemological violence. Mm-hmm. We also have a distinction that critical theorists uh, point out between an individualistic conception of mind, that is uh, what is typically thought of in psychology where we study things like memory, perception, consciousness, and language as individual functions of a person's mind. Uh, Critical theory holds uh, a sociocultural and socio-historical conception of mind. (laughs) 
the idea that memory is not something that exists in the brain. Memory is something that exists within a historical and um, environmental context with that individual. So there's uh, not a, as as sharp of a distinction between the, the, the mind and the brain as the center of uh, memory, perception, consciousness, and language, but a critical um, socio-historical conception of mind. Maybe um, a, a, an entry into this would be thinking of uh, uh, memory changes that take place uh, when um, an elderly person moves from the home they lived in for 40 years uh, to uh, a new, like a nursing home or something, and how we see then memory decline. Uh, and from an individualistic conception, memory decreases. From a critical theory perception, uh, the context changes, uh, which it alters the function of of uh, of the functioning, the cognitive functioning. So we're we're looking here at a distinct difference. Uh, when in critical hermeneutic psychology of a socio-historical conception of mind and how it's researched versus the contemporary current uh, view of an individualistic conception of mind. This uh, idea of a socio-historical uh, conception of mind goes back to Hegel. And uh, Hegel described um, three different types of mind. Uh, he said there's a subjective mind, and that's where the individuals, like m habit, desire, memory, things that are personal to us. It's an individual aspect of mind, the subjective mind. The objective mind would be uh, things that are social, socially oriented, so ethics and law, the things that we understand I I in the social context. And then the absolute mind, uh, and this we can see reflected in the hermeneutic tradition, uh, the absolute mind is is cultural it's cultural aspects art religion culture thinking uh products artificial products that we that we as humans culturally uh culturally manifest through the individual artists things we create one of the most um profound and important thinkers within the hermeneutic uh, tradition for psychology is wilhelm diltai uh, Diltai uh, wrote a text called Descriptive Psychology and Historical Understanding. Uh, we're going to look at some of the major concepts of that, uh, of that paper. Um, Diltai understands that uh, he has an interesting point of view. The part that, is, uh, that connects him to our, to our other thinkers, our previous thinkers, is the idea that uh, the mind cannot be studied uh, out of the context of its history uh, and its social construct. So the idea of the mind is socially historically, a social historical construction. So this is the hermeneutic critical theory aspect of this in Diltai, the humanistic, the hermeneutic rather uh, aspect of this. So we can't understand the mind as this thing that exists independent from history and culture. Uh, the interesting th part about Diltai is that objective, objectivity is something that, that is a product of the mind. So when we look at things such as um, artwork and religious customs and myth and uh, laws and any type of uh, social organizations, these are things that are internalized and become objective in the mind, but are not objective in themselves. It's a, a social construct. So the individual mind is contextually creates this objective reality. Uh, he also points out that the psychologist can study this objective mind um, through what the individual creates. So again, we turn to not studying the brain or the mind, but studying uh Act, cultural acts, religion, art, etc., cultural acts. And uh, he, he really points out strongly we must study people within the context, a, a historical context, not in an isolated, controlled, laboratory, experimental uh, methodology. In contrast to the typical um, behaviorist, positivist, and cognitive idea of focusing on the individual's mind, Diltai uh, discuss three researchers approach, research approaches that could be used by psychologists. The first is content research, um, and this is understanding the meaningful content of an individual's mind. So this would be the difference between an experiment that understands a forgetting curve, such as Ebbinghaus, 
and the actual things that are remembered and understood by the individual. This comes through personal interview. Um, we, we find in, in much of um, the hermeneutic tradition a similarity to what happens in the clinical therapeutic setting uh, for the clinical and counseling psychologist and psychotherapy. Um, largely, this hermeneutic understanding can be seen as, um, as widely used in the psychotherapy aspect. Um, another research method would be descriptive research, um, understanding how this meaningful uh, content operates to, to construct the worldview for the individual, how um, the individual comes to uh, react emotionally um, to in in light of the the content, and then finally structural research, and this is understanding how all of these attitudes and memories and um, and uh, pre preconceptions, how the worldview is constructed, how the pieces integrate integrate together uh, to make the whole, the gestalt, one could say, of the mental life. So these are three aspects of taking a hermeneutic um, investigation into a psychological um, understanding. So these things of cognitive emotion and motivation, he said, these aren't uh, individual things that can be chopped up and studied. Uh, these are things that that uh, are all part of a greater whole that function um Emotion functions as a way of thinking. Motivation is uh, a, a way of thinking about something or behaving without looking at the motivation is nearsighted. So we understand um, these distinctions of, of cognition, emotion, and motivation as separate things uh, that are not interrelated as, as a pro is problematic of the, um, of the natural science tradition. Uh, instead, we see these as as a whole. That uh, that emotion is is a type of thinking, a type of information. Uh, Diltai pointed out that uh, traditionally um, psychology w was part of the Geistenwissenschaften, the human sciences of the German tradition, not Naturwissenschaften, the natural sciences, and that by its nature, um, cognition, emotion, motivation, all of these things are things that that by its nature cannot be studied uh, through the means of the natural sciences. Um, no meaningful understanding of the human condition can come from experimental design and statistics. We, we have to, uh, Diltai says, look at the, uh, the, the underlying understanding uh, of uh, the, the mental events, of the experience. But he was also very careful not to um, set up too much of a... Uh, of a dichotomy here because he said uh, even in the Geisenwissenschaften there seems to be too much of an emphasis on thinking uh, when we have to have a complete understanding of emotion and motivation. He said that emotion and motiv motivation are so uh, integral to the human experience that just understanding thinking by itself leads to a shallow understanding. So we have to understand how motivation and thinking uh, how motivation and emotion are forms of influence and thinking, are forms of the psychology, not just uh, cognition, not just thinking about. So this is looking at an overall human experience. So Dittai uh, was interested in the, the and recommended a descriptive psychology, and in this way describing the individual uh, within their history and within their social context would lead to greater understanding. He said... Uh, we explain nature, but we understand mental life, or we understand the human condition. Uh, and in this way, he he used v v various he he recommended various approaches to psychology, introspection, comparative methods, uh, and experimentation, uh, and also looking at uh, psychopathology, at abnormal psychology. So he didn't exclude uh, some of the the methods of uh, quantitative experimental. Uh, natural science research, but he, he sought to uh, understand rather than explain. And in so doing, um, he, he in, and this is really in the spirit of Wilhelm Wundt in his final work of Volker Psychology, uh, where Wundt himself um, acknowledged and endeavored in his uh, Volker Psychology to um, to create uh, a discussion that uh, went beyond the idea of experimentation. Wundt uh, 
expressed that psychology, what psychology could ex- could study with experiment experimental research methods, uh, quantitative methods, was limited, and that the higher functions had to be studied in a way that was uh, being done with the humanities. Uh, Wundt himself discussed this and pointed out this problem. Unfortunately, that that Volker psychology uh, ten volume work uh, largely goes unread, but it is available online for those who would like to read it. And you'll see topics that Wundt discussed from uh, from from uh, religion to uh, creativity, uh, all type of cultural type psychologies. Diltai um, expressed that um, we could have four approaches to understanding it, and we're looking for what he called the totality of mental life. Uh, It's important to understand that when he refers to objective objectivity, uh, he's talking about cultural artifacts. So his his idea of objective under of objective uh, knowledge would be things such as law and customs, art religion, any type of cultural thing is the objective, the subjective is the individual mind that has created this, the individual mind, including thinking, feeling, and motivation, not just thinking. Uh, so the emphasis here is not only on the the thinking, but on the desire, the motivation, and on the emotional, the, the emotion, emotion to move away from. Uh, and uh, these are all parts of understanding the totality of mental life. So he talks about four forms of understanding. He said uh, we have elementary understanding, which is just everyday life as it happens. We have higher understanding, which is when we understand those happenings within the context of the social and individual context. The highest form of understanding, he said, is when we have an empathy uh, to re-experience uh, of the psychological world that another is living in, to put one's self in that place through understanding, or leading to understanding. And then finally, scientific uh, understanding is a form of understanding um, that leads to hermeneutics. And this is the, the final goal, is to understand uh, the totality of mental life within their context. So this is taking into consideration all of these, these socio-historical uh, the objective cultural and the subjective mental life in context would be what he calls scientific understanding, not to be mistaken from uh, what we understand as natural science, but this is human scientific understanding. Diltai uh, will go on to influence through his idea of types. He, he uh, looked at certain trends that occurred in uh, the human condition and uh, he goes to be um, someone who really uh, influences uh, two uh, hermeneutic psychologists that we'll be studying next, and um, that's Edward Sprenger and Carl Jaspers.